dollar presentation. We are now at 30,000 feet. Retro burnout confirmed. Retro burnout is confirmed. Second. 400 feet per second vertical velocity. 28,000 feet. Unmanned spacecraft, like this surveyor landing on the moon, are sending back information and pictures that will enable us to send men to the moon and on voyages to more distant planets. We're going to see some of the satellites and spacecraft of the future, and we'll find out how space research is improving life right here on Earth today when Discovery takes a closer look at the busy world of outer space. Discovery 68, the award-winning program for young people with Bill Owen. A city on the moon, a lunar base for men to live and work in, is no longer a science fiction fantasy. It's close to becoming a reality. But in order to get this far, we had to find out everything we could about the moon's surface. We sent a series of spacecraft, seven in all, called surveyors to land on the moon and send pictures and scientific information back to the Earth. The surveyor craft are 10 feet high and 14 feet in diameter. Their journey from the Earth to the moon covers 240,000 miles. A 63-hour trip begins with a launch by the Atlas Centaur rocket. As the cocoon opens, the first stage burns out and separates. Then the second stage ignites. The surveyor unfolds and leaves the second stage rocket behind. Then the solar panels are erected to give the surveyor craft precise directional control in space. Its small jet motors turn the craft until its two navigation sensors can locate and lock onto two fixed points in space, the sun and the star Canopus. Then, Surveyor can guide itself using these two reference points, like a beacon. The Deep Space Tracking Network on Earth monitors the flight and sends commands to the spacecraft during its long voyage to the moon. As Surveyor approaches within a thousand miles of the moon's surface, the ground control positions it so that its retro rockets will be able to slow it down from its 5,000 miles per hour speed. And then, the main propulsion rocket is jettisoned. At 60 miles from the surface, the spacecraft's own radar signals take over. The last few moments of the flight, monitored at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory Control Center in California, are the most critical. 4,000 feet, stable. 400 feet. 200 feet. 100 feet per second. 100 feet. 100 feet. 13 feet per second, 13 feet per second speed. Touch, the button touchdown. With a perfect landing accomplished, Surveyor's real work begins. It sends a series of over 10,000 television pictures back to Earth with detailed close-ups of the moon's surface. Command has been transmitted to take the picture. The first portion of these pictures will be with the lens at wide angle setting, now proceeding to a multiple sequence of pictures. It looks good. Surveyor is reported in excellent condition. All signals look good. A surveyor type of spacecraft is not designed to be recovered. Once it lands, it must remain on the surface. But there's another craft called LEM for Lunar Module that will be able to land men on the moon and take off again under its own power. The first manned landings scheduled by 1970 are part of the Apollo space program. Marked by the successful launching in 1967 of the first giant Saturn V rocket booster system, Apollo will carry three astronauts in the regular command module with the lunar module attached. One astronaut remains in orbit around the moon in the command module. The other two enter the LEM, separate, and land on the moon's surface. 
After a short stay on the moon, the two men will relaunch the LEM and rendezvous with the command module, which will return all three of them to Earth. After the first Apollo missions, this same Saturn rocket can be modified to carry more men and material to build an actual lunar base. The base may look something like this. Because there's no air on the moon, we'd have to have our own supply. The spacecraft landing port might have a sliding dome to allow men to move about freely as they enter or leave the spacecraft. The living and working quarters of this city would have to be underground because of the extremes of heat and cold, for protection from harmful solar radiation, and to provide a continual supply of fresh air. These are some of the difficulties, but the rewards could be great. The moon may look dead and empty, but it does have many resources and advantages. Because of its lack of atmosphere and no wind or turbulence, the moon is a better platform than the Earth for observing outer space. Since its gravity is only one-sixth that of the Earth, it would make an ideal rocket base for launching future explorations. For instance, a rocket that needs 600,000 pounds of thrust when launched from the Earth would need only 100,000 pounds to leave the moon. All of the supplies we need to support life might be manufactured directly from elements that exist in the moon soil. Nuclear or solar furnaces may extract water by heating the rocks of the moon. And by separating the water into hydrogen and oxygen, we could have both a source of power and air to breathe. And we should be able to grow our own food there as well. First, we would bring a small amount of algae to the moon. Algae are small, one-celled green plants that would serve two purposes. They can be made directly into food, and they can also serve as air purifiers. Like most green plants, algae will multiply rapidly and can convert carbon dioxide into fresh oxygen. Besides algae, we can also grow regular fruits and vegetables in special tanks using either lunar soil or highly concentrated chemical solutions. These are called hydroponic farms, and experiments here on Earth have proven that a large amount of food can be grown in a very small area. To do this, the lunar base would need a wide range of chemicals and plant nutrients. Although it may seem strange, the early rocket transports will probably be carrying loads of fertilizer to the moon. At first, almost everything will have to be brought from Earth. But when a moon base becomes self-supporting, it might truly become our ideal stepping stone into deep space. We'll find out how we're going to travel there, and we'll see some of the many unusual ways that space research is helping to improve our life on Earth right now. We'll do that in just a minute. How would you like to take a vacation trip in a rocket and visit your friends on Moon City? This is what the moon might look like when you get there, according to the scientists at North American Rockwell in Downey, California. The scientists who are working in outer space research today are facing the same kind of questions people asked in 1492, when Columbus found a new world. Why bother going there if it's so expensive and dangerous? What are we going to find? What good will it do us? In the 1400s, it took many years to prove the value of exploration. But today, with satellites and rockets to do our exploring, we can find out what this busy new world of outer space is doing to improve our lives on Earth right now. The very idea of traveling in space is exciting in itself. And the first steps have already been taken. OK, I'm out. Right now, I'm standing on my head, and I'm looking right down. It looks like we're coming up on the coast of California. This is the greatest experience I've just remember. Now, I've come above the spacecraft. I'm coming back down now. I'm under my own control. One thing about it, uh, when, when Ed gets out there and starts wiggling around, it sure makes the spacecraft out the control. Sometime before 1970, men are scheduled to land on the moon. And after that, Mars. And then voyages to the more distant planets of our solar system. Exploring outer space has many long-range benefits, but there are also many immediate and very practical ways that space science is helping us today. Radio and television programs are relayed across the world by communication satellites in orbit around the Earth. 
as many as 300 two-way telephone conversations across continents and oceans can be handled at the same time by one satellite. High altitude weather forecasting helps us to predict storms and hurricanes, earthquakes and floods. Satellites are able to transmit information and pictures as well. These photographs were actually taken by satellite. They show a sequence of cloud formations developing over the Earth. By using special infrared cameras that can penetrate through smoke, forest fires can be located and controlled before they spread over vast areas. Because certain types of rock formations can be seen better from space, geologists are able to locate mineral and oil deposits underground. And in the oceans, schools of fish and plankton can be observed quickly and easily by these cameras. Our latest satellites are now able to take pictures in full color. This is one of the first color pictures of the Earth ever taken by satellite. All of these are models, one third the size of actual satellites that are in orbit today around the Earth. This is one of the first, called SINCOM. It was launched in 1963. This is Early Bird, launched in 1965. This one's called INTELSAT, which stands for International Telecommunications Satellite. And this is the latest one of the series, ATS, the Applications Technology Satellite, which not only can take color photographs, but can provide us with other scientific information as well. After being launched by a large booster rocket, the satellites use their own small rocket motors, which enable them to reach the proper position to go into orbit around the Earth while using these antennas to send back information to the Earth. They all use solar panels to change the sun's energy into electrical power. And most important of all, they remain in synchronous orbit. That is, they maintain the same relative position to the Earth as they continually orbit around it. The satellite actually remains fixed in the sky with almost half the world in continuous view. To see how it's done, let's watch an actual launch. An Atlas Agena rocket carries the spacecraft into a parking orbit. Then the capsule separates. And controlled by space stations from the ground, the satellite's own rockets thrust it into the proper elliptical orbit around the Earth. To keep the satellite's cameras and antennas continually fixed towards the Earth, the craft can be spin-stabilized. The rocket motors start it spinning around. Once it's begun to revolve, it will continue to spin by itself. Another way of keeping a satellite pointing toward Earth would not require any spinning at all. This later method will use long stabilizing booms. The longest ones are 130 feet in length. The weight of the booms balances the satellite, the way a tightrope walker uses a pole. The booms keep the satellite pointed towards the Earth once it's in its correct orbit. You might wonder how they can fit such long booms inside the small satellite. After it's placed into orbit, a small motor unwinds the reel of tape, which is specially designed to curl into the form of a long tube as it unwinds out into space. When fully extended, the booms would cover an area almost as large as a football field. These satellites are able to broadcast continually to a series of ground stations all over the globe, covering a range from the United States to Australia and Japan. In addition, they can transmit messages, send weather and space information directly to aircraft or spacecraft. More than a hundred different satellites have already been launched by several countries into the busy world of outer space. They're all designed to provide us with information that we can use right now here on Earth. They're also able to tell us what we need to know about space before sending men aloft. The spacecraft of the future that will carry men on journeys to nearby planets and into deep space are being designed today. We're going to see some of the space stations of the future where men can live and work in comfort in outer space. We'll do that in just a minute. Where do we go after the moon? One of the suggestions for the future is to have a self-contained orbiting space station that could be sent aloft and positioned anywhere we wanted it. Here's a model of a proposed space station that could fit into the same Saturn rocket that carries the Apollo spacecraft. After being placed into orbit and separated from the rocket, the arms of the station would automatically unfold. 
and locked together in the shape of a wheel. Fully extended, it would be 150 feet in diameter. Small rocket motors would impart enough spin to give the station an artificial gravity. Such a station would serve as a manned laboratory performing experiments and scientific observations impossible from an Earth base. It could serve as a docking station for refueling and maintenance of other spacecraft and a command and control center for more distant voyages, like a trip to Mars or Venus. Some of these ideas of space research may seem fantastic to us, but people are working to make the dreams of today into the realities of tomorrow. One of those people is Dr. Kraft Erika of the Autonetics Division of North American Rockwell. Dr. Eric is one of the leading space scientists in our country today. He's been looking into the future uses of outer space, of space as a place to live. Dr. Erica, I understand this is an idea you have for a space hospital of the future, right? Yes, Bill, that's correct. A space hospital may sound like a far out idea, but uh, observations that we have made so far during manned spaceflight indicate that uh, such a hospital may have attractive uh, medical possibilities. How large would this hospital be? Well, approximately 300 feet from one end of the system to the other. You see, each one of these uh, resembles a ladder, and each section of the ladder is a wing, and each rung on the ladder is actually a wall. Now, the system very slowly rotates. So you'd have lower gravity or low G conditions near the hub. And increasing G conditions as you go further out. Now, patients who have been treated in the low-G wards will gradually be transferred after long stay time in these low-G wards into high-G wards where they will be reconditioned for existence on Earth. I see. Now, over here we have an enlarged version of one of the hospital wards. Yes, that is correct. You see uh, how this ward ties in with the end beams of the ladder through which the patients would be transported until they get to the ward into which they are delivered. And then they're being transported over here into the ward. Now, this is not a sick bed ward, but a ward in which there's an operating room here in the center. From a medical point of view, what would be the benefits of having a, ho a hospital in outer space? Well, primarily the effect of low gravity, and in addition to this, the effect of vacuum that you have. And you can use this by actually establishing vacuum chambers, as you do here on Earth, uh, hyperbaric chambers for delicate heart operations. You can do that in space quite easily, of course, because you are surrounded by vacuum. You just uh, separate one section of a ward and evacuate it. So the emptiness of space actually becomes an asset medically. That is correct. Now, there's something else that fascinates me. This is a design for a space hotel of the future. Yes. Uh, it's a large structure which is actually completely self-sufficient and serves as an orbital tourist facility. Now, where are the actual rooms in this hotel? Well, you see, those light green parts here are 12-story buildings, and each story contains four rooms. Now, uh, Dr. Erica, these don't look quite the same as the hotel rooms. Is that something else? Yes, these are hydroponic gardens and animal shelters in which you are actually feeding and raising animals to supply fresh food for the hotel. It would not be economically uh, worthwhile to carry every steak up from Earth. Now, what about these red areas? They simulate conditions on the surface of other planets at the correct gravitational level. So they are uh, part of the tourist facilities and attractions. So you could simulate a visit to Mars or Venus? That is correct. It'd be quite a vacation. Yes. And if you wanted a hotel room with a view, this would be the ultimate. You have you places here and you look down at the Earth, which is very beautiful. How about the yellow chambers? Are they different from the red? Yes. The yellow chambers are main attractions, a dinaria in which people under near zero conditions of gravity actually float around and uh, use it in the same manner in which you would use a large swimming pool in a hotel on Earth. The accommodations in the hotel rooms could actually be quite comfortable. Here we have a good view of some of the rooms in our space hotel. That's right, Bill. This is one of the parts, and you see three floors indicated here. Each one consists of four rooms, and you see it has all the conveniences that you would have in an Earth hotel. And here we see the passengers on the space hotel at play in the giant playrooms. That is right. This is the interior of one of the dinaria in which you see the people floating around in near weightless condition. You could devise all sorts of interesting games in this state of weightlessness. Yes. In fact, we have thought of many of these, and really the only limit is your imagination. 
You see, space basically is a very friendly environment. People normally don't think of it in these terms, but consider the fact that there are no winds, there's no rain, there are no bacteria, there's no decay. It is a clean, beautiful environment. It looks as if that world of outer space promises to be very busy indeed. That is correct. Space is basically a friendly environment, and I'm sure many things will happen in it in the future. Well, Dr. Araki, you've certainly shown us some unusual ideas for outer space today. Yes, the future promises to be exciting in the busy world of outer space. We'll be back in just a minute. As we've seen today, the busy world of outer space has already begun to change our lives. Your television set may have printed electrical circuits originally designed for spacecraft. We're using midget transistors for tiny portable radios and TVs, powered by long-life nickel or silver cadmium batteries. In communications, weather information, improved crops, and better medicine, the space age has already helped improve our lives here on Earth. In the future, perhaps in 20 or 25 years, you may visit a lunar base or an orbiting hotel. Who knows? There's a whole new world out there waiting to be discovered. If you'd like to find out more about space, ask your librarian for any of these books. Robots in Space by Michael Chester. All About Satellites and Spaceships by David Dietz. And this book, The Uses of Space by Ben Bova. Be with us next week as Discovery continues to discover America. Bye-bye. The Discovery Unit's transportation and promotional consideration provided by United Airlines. has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News and Public Affairs.